so that by 11 years of age, they are short and fatter than you would expect uh, compared to the rest of the population. The pattern of growth in girls is similar, but slightly different. But importantly, again, during uh, early life, they, their growth in height and weight is challenged. They tend to be thin. And then during uh, late childhood, they have accelerated growth so that their weight for height, their body mass index increases, and so they are short uh, and relatively uh, fat. Here is the risk of metabolic syndrome during adulthood for the same population, and this is plotted as odds ratio. And so the obese individuals, are the, what is plotted here in terms of the mean and the 95% confidence intervals, and you can see that the height is less than, uh, than, than, than normal and remains less than normal. Their weight deteriorates further, so their BMI gets progressively worse. And at 11 years of age, they are shorter, uh, they are a little shorter, but much thinner than the rest of the population. And these are the children who go on to become obese and develop metabolic syndrome. And so we can characterize the pattern of growth from infancy during childhood through puberty to adulthood and think about the factors that determine or influence growth at those different periods to give us an understanding of what the interplay might be between nutritional exposure and the other factors that load on growth. Importantly, the question is, because these children are already either short or underweight at birth, we have to consider the factors that actually give rise to poor uh, growth during the fetal life and the factors that impact upon that. And in general, there are three major players, the genes we are born with, the hormonal environment we experience, and the nutrients that we get from our placenta. And so size at birth has to be considered against the factors that influence that, maternal height, maternal weight gain during pregnancy, the nutrients that the mother makes available, the genetic opportunity for the infant, and the extent to which there are infections or stresses during the pregnancy. And the, those are the main factors that load on size at birth. One important question is, how about genes? Because there is a community that think that everything that happens to us in life is set in our genes. And the question is, how important is that? Is that, is that the whole truth or part of the truth. And from one of the earlier studies in Finland, it was possible to look at the insulin resistance syndrome in relationship to the genes for PPAR gamma and the polymorphisms of that and birth weight in relationship to the, these three polymorphisms. And if you look at that, uh, at those individual, again, Finnish people, for whom there are this rich data set, you can see that for those individuals who had the genotype PA or AA, there was no relationship between the uh, insulin resistant in, in, resistance index, the HOMA index, and birth weight. But for those that had the PP genotype, there was a strong inverse relationship. And so this relationship with birth size in this population depended upon your genotype. And it was much exaggerated for particular genotypes uh, in relationship to the intrauterine environment. So it's not that it's all genes. It's not that it's nothing to do with genes. There is an interaction with genes. And the question is, well, how extensive and how important might that be? And it's difficult to say. There is an important task to be, uh, to be followed to find out how much that is. And so this plot looks at the interaction between prenatal growth and risk of and, and high risk genotypes for type 2 di diabetes. And this is a forest plot which shows the risk of, um, of low birth weight. So the null line is uh, birth weight. On the left is increased risk for low birth weight. On the right hand side is decreased risk for low birth weight. And you can see a variable response. But importantly, the statement is that um, for impaired insulin secretion and type 2 diabetes, there may be an inter interaction between size at birth and particular genotypes, which needs to be thought about in population studies. 
Let me move on to think through some of the issues related to the mother's ability to provide nutrients to the fetus. Because ultimately, the baby can only grow if it's provided with the energy, the nutrients, the cofactors that are required for net tissue deposition. And we know from old physiological studies that the mother has to anticipate the needs of the baby, metabolic anticipation, that the mother's body undergoes changes under hormonal influences from very early in pregnancy. And this uh, slide simply shows the changes in the cardiovascular system, the system that will deliver nutrients to the uterus and hence to the placenta. And what it shows is that from very early in pregnancy, there are changes in cardiac output and plasma volume, which are far sooner than there are is the need by the baby to increase the, mass of the, the amount of nutrients that it has. And so there are changes in cardiac output from even from before the fifth week of pregnancy, even before the woman be knows that she realizes she's pregnancy, and changes in plasma volume, which increase throughout pregnancy. Importantly, we know that if these changes don't take place, if a woman fails to acquire an increase in cardiac output and plasma volume during the first five, six, seven uh, weeks of pregnancy, those are blighted pregnancies and those babies fail to develop normally. And therefore, understanding the factors that enable the mother's anticipation and setting up the environment within which the baby can grow is very important. Because what we are considering is the factors that determine the rate of nutrient delivery to the placenta so that the placenta has the opportunity to access those nutrients. And there are two factors that will determine that. The nutrients in the circulation, what their concentration is, and the flow rate of blood to the placenta. Importantly, the requirement or the demand of the fetus for nutrients varies at different periods of pregnancy. During the second trimester, there is maximum lean tissue acquisition. During the third trimester, there is maximal adipose tissue uh, acquisition. And therefore, the mother has to be able to respond to those needs and make the nutrients available appropriate for the stage of pregnancy. And the mother's ability to meet that demand will be determined by her own nutritional status and her own maturation. For well-nourished women, we know that the, what she brings to the pregnancy in terms of her height and weight at the start of pregnancy are at least as, much, as, least as important, if not more important, than what she consumes during pregnancy. And indeed, her metabolic setup, her metabolic behavior during pregnancy is the most important factor determining the size of, of, of her baby. And so we have three different metabolic states that a woman can come to a pregnancy. If she is well nourished, she has adequate nutrient reserves, and she can readily buffer any uneven demand. If she's undernourished, there's an increased dependence upon a dietary intake to make up a deficit, and that's a very vulnerable uh, situation because it presumes she knows what to take in a diet in relationship to the timing of the pregnancy. If she's overnourished, being overnourished already indicates her inability to manage and partition nutrients well within her own body and inability to access her own reserves, and therefore her, a, a, a challenging of her ability to make the nutrients available to the placenta. And we know without any difficulty now that the, the nutritional state of an early pregnancy is determined by what the mother has eaten as she comes to pregnancy. Our clearest example of that is folic acid and neural tube defects, but there are many other examples. It determines the quality of the egg, the reserves of nutrients that are in the egg as it is fertilized. It determines the environment of that egg as it flows through the fallopian tube, the secretions that it finds there and in the uterus, and it determines the quality of the placentation, the quality of the nutrient supply line that will be set up for later pregnancy. And so in terms of nutritional well-being, we have the baby, the fetus, which has a demand that's variable in terms of the amounts and the proportions in time. We have a placenta, which has to anticipate that demand, which grows before the baby, 
and has to be able to deliver a quantitative nutrients in terms of the capacity in the reserve and also a qualitative uh, basis in terms of the, the environment that the mother finds herself in. And one of the important questions is the limiting considerations within the placenta that constrain the mother's ability to deliver sufficient nutrients to the fetus. And so there is the maternal vasculature which makes the nutrients available to the placenta, which processes and carries the nutrients across to the baby in order for the baby to grow normally. And each of those is vulnerable to wider environmental stresses in terms of the quality, the intensity, and the duration. And that is a framework that we're trying better to understand in order to enable mothers to have better quality pregnancies. Environmental stresses aren't simply biological. They are also behavioral in terms of lifestyle choices, and importantly, sociological con considerations, heavy work, adolescents all represent stresses on pregnancy which increase the challenges. The body's response to those challenges, there is a common response in terms of the uh, activation of the hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal axis and the activity of the hormones in the body leading to an inflammatory and or immune response. All of those shift the availability of nutrients. It alters the nutrient intake, it alters the nutrient delivery, it alters the nutrient demands, and it increases nutrient losses. And therefore, stresses and environmental challenges are very important modulators of pregnancy and act through the placenta. And so Davies' increasing interest over the last five years has been on the particular role that the placenta plays. Some of his very earliest observations in the 1980s uh, were related to the relative size of the placenta compared to the size of the fetus. And he has returned to that given our increasing understanding of how placenta grow and operate. And the important observation is that placenta grow along two axes. There is a longitudinal axis which defines how the placenta lies against the longitudinal axis of the uterus. And then there is the transverse axis, which defines how extensively the placenta wraps around the uterus. And the general observation is that vulnerable placentas are placentas that have variable uh, transverse axes. The placentas, the, the longitudinal axis, provides very little information, but a comparison of the transverse diameter with the longitudinal diameter gives us a great deal of information. And one of the important statements about the placenta, it is a conversation, a communication between the maternal blood supply and the fetal blood supply. And how those two blood supplies talk to each other and deliver nutrients and other, uh, other, uh, other information is a condition of the placenta. And therefore, the ability to set up a placenta from early in pregnancy, 10th, 11th, 12th week of pregnancy, enable that to grow, determines what is going to be available to the fetus. And it, later in the meeting, you will hear much more detailed considerations about how fetal growth is related to placental development. This slide simply shows the relationship between preeclampsia and placental dimensions in terms of the odds ratio of preeclampsia uh, in terms of that uh, lesser diameter. And those women who have a, a poorer placenta because they have a smaller lesser diameter have a much greater risk of preeclampsia. Their blood communication between the mother and the fetus is much uh, less. And so what happens in the placenta now is seen as a very powerful statement about the nutritional opportunity that the mother offers to her fetus to enable it to grow. And so we have these two sides the exposure of size at birth and postnatal outcomes and prenatal exposure that lead to birth size. One is the outcome of an antenatal event, one, the other is an exposure for postnatal events, and the placenta lies between these two experiences to characterize the opportunity. <laughs>